Welcome to lecture 11. In today's preparation lecture, we will develop a model for the rigid rotator and apply it to diatomic molecules to predict the rotational spectra. Additionally, we will discuss the solutions to this problem to understand how they are quantized, as this will be directly related to the quantum numbers used for the hydrogen atom. This lecture will be broken up into three pieces. We will first talk about changing coordinates from a linear basis to an angular one. Then, we will solve the Schrodinger equation for the rigid rotator. And finally, we will discuss how this system is quantized and what are the physical ramifications that result from it. All the problems to this point, it has been convenient to operate in a linear Cartesian basis set. However, since we're going to be working with something that is spinning in any direction, it will now be simpler if we operate it in a spherical basis set. We must also now operate in three dimensions. In the top line is the Schrodinger equation for three dimensions. All that is different is that there are now double derivatives for both the y and z direction in addition to the x direction. So now it reads negative h bar squared over 2 times mu. And this is all times d squared psi by dx squared plus d squared psi by dy squared plus d squared psi by dz squared all plus the potential times psi and this is equal to the energy times psi. The three double derivatives added together inside the parentheses has a special symbol associated with it called the Laplacian, and it is denoted as an upside down delta squared. Using the Laplacian symbol, we can simplify the Schrodinger equation to read negative h bar squared over 2 times the reduced mass mu times the Laplacian times psi plus u times psi plus e times psi. Since we will be looking at solutions to the Schrodinger equation for something that is rotating, then the math becomes easier to solve by using spherical coordinates. To change from Cartesian to spherical, we substitute for all x's r sine theta cos phi, we substitute for y r sine theta sine phi, and for z we substitute in r cosine theta. And the bounds we would use are theta operates between 0 and pi, phi operates between 0 and 2 pi, and r operates between 0 and infinity as shown in a diagram on the right. These substitutions can be easily taken care of. One good reason for writing the Schrodinger equation using the Laplacian is that if we were to change, change basis sets, like we are here from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates, then we would just need to use the Laplacian for the new coordinates instead. The Laplacian for spherical coordinates are 1 over r squared times d by dr, and that applies to a term that's r squared times d by dr plus 1 over r squared sine theta d by d theta, and that derivative operates on sine theta d by d theta, plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta times d squared by d phi squared. Let's now look at what a rigid rotator looks like. Consider a spinning diatomic molecule with two masses m1 and m2 at a fixed distance r1 and r2 from their center of mass. We can treat this system as having one mass fixed at the center with the other mass, with the reduced mass mu, rotating around the origin at a distance r. The kinetic energy of a rigid rotator is 1 half i omega squared, where i being the moment of inertia is mu times r squared. Omega in this case is called the angular velocity. The angular momentum is defined as the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. And so the kinetic energy can be expressed as l squared over 2 times i. Let's now look at the Hamiltonian for the rigid rotator. Here I have it written out already where h hat is equal to negative h bar squared over 2 times mu times the Laplacian plus the potential u. In this case, since the rigid rotator is not operating in a potential, then the u just disappears completely. We can cross it off. And so our Hamiltonian is simply going to be expressed as negative h bar squared over 2 times mu times the Laplacian. Now we just saw in a previous slide that the Laplacian, we can substitute that in for spherical coordinates. So then h bar or h hat is equal to negative h bar squared over 2 times mu. And subbing in for the Laplacian, I'm going to write 1 over r squared d by dr. And that's going to operate on r squared d by dr. To that, I'm going to add. 1 over r squared sine theta, d by d theta, that will operate on sine theta, 
d by d theta. The third term plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta d squared by d phi squared. Now in this case remember we're dealing with something where it's called the rigid rotator and so the rigidness comes in from the fact that we have essentially a dumbbell that's going to be spinning in space. And so this distance between these two atoms is going to be set to be equal to r. And it's some fixed value, hence the term rigid rotator. So because of that, any term where we have a rate of change of the radius, like this first term right here where we have these d by dr terms, we know that when we take the derivative with respect to r, and the r isn't going to change at all, then we know that this term is just going to go to zero. It's going to disappear completely, since again, it's not going to change with respect to r. So that term is disappeared. It goes to zero. So we're only left with two terms now, just this second term and this final term. Because now both of these terms also have a 1 over r squared, then as next step, I'm going to pull out that 1 over r squared out to the front. So now my Hamiltonian reads h hat is equal to h bar squared over 2 mu times r squared, and then that's equal to 1 over sine theta, d by d theta, and that operates on sine theta d by d theta. That's going to be plus 1 over sine squared theta d squared by d phi squared. Continuing forward, what I can write is I can say the moment of inertia of this particle, that's capital I, that's going to be equal to mu times r squared, which is exactly this term that I have up front. And so my final step that I'm having, that I will have here to define my Hamiltonian, is just going to be equal to negative h bar squared over 2 times i. And again, that's multiplied with 1 over sine theta d by d theta. And that operates on sine theta d by d theta. To that, I'm going to add 1 over sine squared theta d squared by d phi squared. So returning to this image of my rigid rotator that I have up here at the top, which is basically a dumbbell, what I'm again pointing out is that as soon as the radius uh, or the distance between my two atoms is defined, then that means that the system is fully defined by just using theta and phi to define its position in terms of rotation around one axis and rotation around the other axis. And we can see this in the Hamiltonian as well, where in this case now we have no values of, of r except for what's hidden inside my moment of inertia. But again, that just defines the moment of inertia of the particle. It has nothing to do with the position, since again, it's fully defined by theta and phi. This means that when we write the Schrodinger equation, we can write a system where we would say the Hamiltonian is operating on some function of theta and phi, and what I should I have returned is that function of theta and phi times the energy. In this case, we're not going to use psi to denote the wave function solutions of the system. Instead, we'll use an uppercase y, which is the typical nomenclature for this problem. However, we're going to treat it the same as psi, where we can write this eigenvalue-eigenvector relationship with the Hamiltonian. 